This video is dedicated to my uncle Todd, who loved Zappa, Beefheart, and all things off the beaten path. I know he would have dug this video. I'm aware there's a lot of analysis and transcription content on the internet about Trout Mask Replica. A lot of it is pretty overwhelming. We're often staring at bewildering sheet music or talking about crazy time signatures. For my take, I wanted to remove some of the academia from the room and just create a nice, cozy environment by the piano, invite all my fuzzy friends of the internet forest, and play for you a few of my favorite sections from this dearly beloved work, with a little bit of theory and analysis interspersed. Why Trout Mask Replica Makes Me Happy There's nothing inevitable about Trout Mask Replica. On the main drag of psychedelic rock, it wasn't a signpost, but a hard left turn at a critical and extremely fertile moment in the late 60s. A foreboding mobile home community a half mile down a dead-end gravel road filled with terrors and curiosities many would rather just continue passing over. In short, it didn't have to exist, and more than 50 years later, many still think it shouldn't. The story goes that Don Van Vliet, aka Captain Beefheart, composed much of this fragmentatious music on the piano. He is not a piano player, which drummer arranger John French then transcribed and further sculpted into shape through rigorous band rehearsals. And somehow, through a deranged game of telephone, we've wound up back here at the piano. The term experimental music gets thrown around a lot these days and in my belief is largely misused. To use John Cage's candid definition, an experimental action is one the outcome of which is not foreseen. What's so refreshing and life-affirming about Trout Mask Replica for me is that it really seems like an honest experiment. I just doubt that Captain Beefheart or John French really had a grand vision of how this was all going to turn out. Although Captain Beefheart was inspired by the music concrete style rhythmic tape splicing, to attempt this chopped up style with a live rock and roll band was unheard of. The ingredients were fashioned, somehow it all got put together, and it's here. Although the album has perplexed many, any close listener can hear the care and rigor that went into crafting it. It's true experimental music. Oh, by the way, I'm not trying to convince you you should like this album if you fucking hate it. I'll admit that my experience was similar to uh, Matt Groening, creator of The Simpsons. In his words, The first time I heard it, I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever heard. It was just sloppy cacophony. Then I listened to it a couple more times, and about the third time, I realized they were doing it on purpose. They meant to sound exactly this way. About the sixth or seventh time, it clicked in, and I thought it was the greatest album I'd ever heard. It took me several listens for something to click, but I was so confused and intrigued that I kept going back. And also, don't ever let someone tell you you should like music just because it's more complex or sophisticated. That's dumb. Subsequently cited as an influence on noise rock, post-punk, etc., the obvious blues lineage behind Captain Beefheart's vernacular, imagery, storytelling, and vocal style, Chester Burnett, aka Helen Wolf being the most vivid, cannot be ignored. But the juxtaposition with the accompanying music makes it quite puzzling, and the blues style sampling not a borrow but a true steal wherein Beefheart makes it his own, even when sounding like a Howlin' Wolf impersonator. And I would never seriously discuss this music in the same breath as Delta Blues legends like Lead Belly, Robert Johnson, or my personal favorite, Blind Willie Johnson. But unlike the blues, there aren't a lot of chord progressions going on in this album. It's pretty much just a stew of counterpoint, which makes this album more of a horizontal experience than a vertical one. The vertical harmonies would be rather pointless to analyze, as what we hear prominently is the horizontal line. It's like measuring a bird's migration pattern by how high they are off the ground. I couldn't find it when I was piecing together this video, but I once read a retrospective review of this album that said something along the lines of, Trout Mask Replica is not Captain Beefheart's most notorious album, only due to it being his most avant-garde and experimental, but also because it's his most sincere work lyrically. And when I think about it, it'd be a lot harder for me to care this much about the album if the poetry and themes didn't resonate and seem heartfelt. The texts cover a lot of ground on the human condition. We have meditations on world peace and human connectedness. Pastoral poetry. Self-image. And societal gender norms. love and admiration, the romance of being isolated from society when out in nature, 
Orange Claw Hammer tells the story of an estranged pirate father coming upon his daughter of 30 years and telling her of the events that led to her coming to be. And of course, the absurdist humor and vivid sound poetry of songs like Neon Meat Dream of a Octafish um, made for many quotables. Mucus Mules Trot, Tra-La. 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 Also, a tin teardrop. Now it's time for our beautiful moments. The stitching together of short repetitive fragments is the primary compositional language of Trout Mask Replica, with the dueling guitar counterpoint at the fuel at the forepoint forepoint at the forepoint forefront. What follows are some of my favorite dual guitar fragments throughout the album, plucked out and placed under the microscope. Disclosure, these are my closest approximations based on what I could make out. I use the original album as my only reference. We all know how low fidelity that is, often isolating the right or the left channel, which I've labeled on my score as well. Notes in parentheses are what I'm referring to as incidental notes, sometimes played, sometimes left out, or optional notes. And I'm really sorry about my clicky F sharp key. I'm getting it fixed this spring, I swear. We'll start off gently with this lovely passage of chordal voicing, that is, chords built by stacking fourths. In guitar left, that's B, E, and A, followed by some movement and a sustained E tone. Guitar right hits G, and sometimes D, under this chord. forming a G6 when combined with guitar left. The sustained tone creates an ambiguous sounding ninth interval. An absolute scream of a chord, invoking the terror of the song's subject matter and our first example of explicit bitonality between the guitars. That is, material in different keys playing simultaneously one key signature often designated to each instrument. Guitar left is in C major or A minor. Its contribution to the panic chord is this C A dyad followed by a C major 7-ish chord C E and B. And a pretty little ditty stepping down and back up. Sounds fine on its own, right? Could be a beginner jazz piano etude. Oh yeah, swingin'. Guitar right is in rock C sharp, either Dorian or Mixolydian. It's mostly just a C sharp power chord, same rhythm as guitar left, but it's staggered, starting an eighth note later followed by some counterpoint material, descending from the root down to the fifth. Now let's put them back together. Beautiful. This panic chord repeats nine times until we get into the melodies. Yikes. The main riff is in E blues, or minor pentatonic, then in the No More Bridge verse, it modulates to sort of E major or C sharp minor, with this angular counterpoint between zoot horn and antenna jimmy. Guitar left has these cool walking up lines under the riff.
And I just love that D natural, that guitar left drops in the third bar of the verse, while guitar right retains the D sharp of the E major mode. Let's hear them together again. A bluesy, syncopated romp, alternating between swung and straight eighths. Guitar right stays pretty static and gives an A minor outline. Guitar left chugs on a D7 for the first measure. The second measure consists of an angular phrase using tones from the A major scale, like G sharp and C sharp. Let's hear a more romantic rendition. Yeah, that's nice. Perfect for that cocktail hour. Speaking of food and drinks, let's see if you recognize this little ditty. Speed it up a bit. That's right, folks, hair pie. By the way, I nearly made myself ill trying to transcribe this rhythm. I still feel a little sick just thinking about it. What I got here is wrong. I don't care. I'm done. I had to move on. Someone else can suffer over it if they want, and I know they will. So in my wrong version, it's 4-4, four four, grounded on this very ungrounded and chromatic bass line. We have more chordal material here in both guitars. Guitar right strums perfect fourths A sharp and D sharp, then rises a half step to B and E. Guitar left accents that half step rise with fourths C sharp and F sharp, a full step above the B and E, creating a clean little cluster. It's also there earlier in parentheses, sometimes striking over the A sharp bass note. I know I said earlier I wasn't going to analyze vertical harmonies, but this one's just really nice. The first chord is E flat over G, so a first inversion major chord. The bass moves to C, I'm calling that C minor 7. And a B in the bass for our last cluster chord. I'm calling that B suspended with an added ninth. Now on the chance that guitar left hits that C sharp F sharp dyad in parentheses, we get another first inversion major chord, F sharp over A sharp. A truly beautiful progression. And last but not least, the hidden gem of Trout Mask Replica. The perfect coda, a curvaceous question mark concluding a jumbled collection of thoughts, reflections, pranks, hopes, and dreams that gazes into the future with an omniscient yet resigned eye as the trout lies down for its eternal sleep. Coming in at a minute and 53 seconds, this passage has been repeatedly suggested to have influenced 80s and 90s experimental rock bands like Slint. It's one of those legendary parts of a song that's fabled to have bred a whole genre. It's just really beautiful music, and it has a cool mellow color compared to many of the more atonal passages we've encountered. Instead of being wholly in two different keys, the guitars employ different modes of the same F sharp minor. Guitar right plays this pentatonic lick in F sharp natural minor with double stops, ending on a placid F sharp minor 11 chord. With the tones F sharp, E, A, and B. Guitar left starts a beat later and uses notes from the F sharp melodic minor. The key difference here being the major 7th, E sharp. 
The result is the buzzy and complex altered dominant sound a lot of jazz pianists and guitarists may be familiar with. I'm thinking dominant of the F sharp minor, so C sharp, augmented 7, sharp 9, resolving to F sharp minor 11. The hanging G sharp tone here colors the F sharp minor 11 by adding a ninth to the top of the chord. A lush open sound impossible on one guitar, so very pianistic in this way. I enlisted a little help to fill out the approximated bass line underneath. Everybody meet Mel, our special guest performer. Say hi, Mel. Now we'll start with the bass and layer one part at a time until all three have joined. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and continue to look for beautiful moments in your world. Come on, let's just try. Last one, last one, really last one. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> ah. I messed up. You did perfect.